The Curse of the Bloodwood by Heather Carter Chapter 1 Rain pelted my face, mingling with cold tears as I fled for my life. My scarlet cloak trailed behind me like a wash of blood upon the undergrowth. I was too visible in the green canvas of Tillwood Forest and miles from the palace of the Moonstone Court. Quickly I unclasped my cloak with my rope-bound hands and let it fall behind me. An emerald-colored gown would be far less conspicuous in the gray light of day. Shouts carried on the wind, bringing fresh spirals of ice dancing around my spine. I dared to turn, locks of pale blonde hair whipping across my cheek. Two figures moved through the trees in the distance, searching for me. Coachmen turned captors. I had awoken from their poison, untied my feet, and leapt from the moving carriage. Now I was running through the forest like a hunted stag. Something capped the tree line at the top of the rise ahead. A low stone wall stretched in either direction as far as I could see. My heart dropped. The end of my cover, maybe the end of everything. The voices were close enough that it would be impossible to backtrack now. So, with burning legs and bursting lungs, I stumbled my way up the hill until I reached the wall. There she is, shouted a rough voice. Give it up, little rabbit. You'll never escape. I threw myself upon the wall and tumbled off the other side. With a shriek, I fell a short distance onto the ground beyond and started rolling. The world was a dizzy swirl of fragrant grass until my back met with something solid. Groaning in pain, I opened my eyes. A green canopy of leaves soared above me. An enormous oak had stopped my whirling tumble. More shouts reached my ears. Snapping my attention to the right, I saw the wall at the top of the hill. At any moment, my captors would leap over it, and I'd be in their grasp soon after. My limbs shook from fatigue and fear. The pounding in my chest echoed in my head. The tree was a lone tower, midway down a grassy slope. There was nowhere to hide quickly. Pushing myself to my feet, I was about to turn and flee farther down the hill when I saw the first man appear on the other side of the wall, a tall brute with a menacing scowl. His shorter, though equally cruel, companion soon joined him. They still wore their fine livery with the crest of the Moonstone Court on the lapel. It put an acrid feeling in my stomach to see the symbol of pride and safety upon the breast of men who meant me harm. The moment their gazes fell on me, I knew it was hopeless, but I would not go down without clawing their eyes out and kicking their stomachs in. Gritting my teeth, I opened my mouth to roar at them, only to have my voice snatched away by a more terrifying sight. A new wall sprang over the stone, pushing from the earth in a rapid swell that towered into the sky. Not a wall of stone, but a brown, gnarled hedge with vines as thick as tree trunks and thorns like swords. It rose higher and higher, stretching in each direction. The ground quaked and thundered, mingling with the anguished cries of the coachman. The massive thorns, having impaled them clean through, lifted their bodies with the hedge. Backing up against the tree, I beheld the terror with wide eyes. My body felt like lead. Unable to move, unable to scream, I just watched as the barrier grew until it kissed the sky. The coachman's screams had fallen silent by the time it was finished. Magic fluttered from the hedge, washing through my veins like a ribbon of silk. It was strong, whatever it was. It had protected me and trapped me. After a long while of standing in shock, staring at the monstrosity, I finally stepped away from the tree and took in my surroundings. A large bowl of land, surrounded by hills, stretched before me. 
The wall encircled the entire dell, now overtaken by the hedge, standing at attention like a fortress. A grove of trees, some planted in neat rows, surrounded by a small lake. My heart swelled with hope when my eyes landed on a thatched roof with a smoking chimney poking out among the treetops. It was the sole building visible, but it was a sign of life nonetheless. The sun broke through the clouds just as I gathered my resolve and stumbled ahead down the hill. When I hit level ground, I was in the trees once more. Apples, large and red, hung from the branches, stirring my roaring stomach. I wanted to take one and devour it, but this was no time to stop and eat. My stomach could wait. I resigned myself to begging for mercy from the occupant of the house. At last I arrived at the cottage, a tidy white plaster home with exposed beams and a thatched roof. The smell of warm apple pie reached my nose through the thick glass window, which was slightly ajar. A woman hummed a cheery song within. I wiped my tears and errant locks of hair from my dirty face and stepped up to the flagstone porch. Taking a deep breath, I knocked the sides of my bald fists on the old oaken door. The humming ceased and the floorboards thumped with approaching footsteps. The black iron latch lifted, and a gray eye surrounded by a withered skin peered out at me. It swept up and down under a thick peppered brow, examining my dreadful muddy state. Who are you, and what are you doing here? she asked, her voice high-pitched and sharp as a knife. Taken aback by her tone, I fumbled over my words. My name is Lilia. I was being chased by some men, and I crossed the wall, and then the, the thorns grew. Water filled my vision as I bit my quivering lip, the sickening sound of impaling flesh echoing in my ears. My gaze fell to my wrists poking out from my long bell sleeves. A wash of shame came over me. I need help. Please? The door opened farther, revealing a short, stout old woman in a dark brown dress with a white apron splattered with flour and other food stains. Her hair was a frizzy mixture of gray, white, and streaks of black, pulled back under an old blue handkerchief. The flush in her cheeks and weariness in her eyes spoke of age and toil, and the distrustful set of her jaw told of a life not accustomed to a filthy young woman showing up on her doorstep. Still, she did not slam the door in my face to her credit. "'What assistance do you require?' she asked, crossing her arms and lifting her chin. Hesitantly, I held up my arms. "'Well, if you could cut my bonds, I would very much appreciate it. Oh, and an apple from your orchard, perhaps? And if you could show me a way out of your wall?" She had already disappeared inside the house by the time I was finished speaking. A moment later, she returned with a sharp knife. She cocked an eyebrow and pointed it in my direction. "'Have you already helped yourself to one of my apples?' she asked. With wide eyes, I shook my head. No, of course not. Do you swear it? I nodded eagerly. Yes, I swear. Hmm. She pressed her lips into a tight line. Well, I can't help you cross the wall. If the hedge has sprung up, it has done so for good reason, and it will retreat in its own time. When might that be? She shrugged. Could be a day. Could be a thousand years. My head swam. A thousand years? A lifetime without ever seeing father again sounded nigh unbearable. Oh, calm yourself, girl. You're fey, aren't you? Your kind live forever. Not forever. I didn't dare correct her, though. She was the one with the knife, after all, and I was throwing myself upon her mercy. Taking a deep breath, I fought to recenter myself. Will you please allow me to stay until the hedge has receded? She eyed me shrewdly. The corner of her mouth twisted up in debate. 
my heart thrashed in my chest as every possible outcome danced around in my head. If she should refuse me, where will I go? How will I survive? You may stay here if you are willing to serve me, she said at last. I froze. Serve you? My father was a nobleman. Life for me consisted of being served, not the other way around. I hadn't the foggiest clue of how to do much of anything. Yes, I can see from your fine frock that you may be in need of some guidance, but I am old and in need of assistance. Uncertainty pinched at my insides, turning my stomach sour. Father would be missing me. He may have been in danger from whomever had tried to capture me, but the hedge had grown up like a mountain. I was cold, hungry, and utterly exhausted. All right, I conceded with a sigh, holding out my arms. The woman grinned, her teeth still white as pearls. She placed the blade between my wrists just to the side of the knot, but before she started sawing, her piercing eyes met mine. Now, Lilia, do you swear to serve me to the best of your ability until your time here is well and truly over, following all of my instructions to the letter? And if you should break the rules, you agree to face the consequences? Her words surged through me like a clanging bell, her voice taking on an air of sudden authority. Buzzing filled my head, and a strange tingling ran from fingertip to toe. Magic. I stared at her. Who are you? Your last hope. Why are you helping me? I asked, a bit of suspicion forming in the pit of my stomach. Eyes piercing mine, she frowned. You are in my dell. I am showing you mercy. Would you rather starve in the field waiting for the hedge to come down? I shook my head. Then all I ask is that you serve while you are here. This is not an inn and I am not a philanthropist. Now swear it or you're on your own. The truth sprang from her lips, sealing my resolve. If I were to survive, I had to take a leap of faith, hopefully not into the fire. I nodded. I swear it. A satisfied grin stretched her cheeks, and she barely flicked her wrists before the layers of rope snapped in two and fell to the ground. I gasped and stepped back, grasping my sore wrist. What? How? She waved her fingers, and two hands pressed in between my shoulder blades, pushing me into the house after her. I cried out and attempted to turn around, only to find there was no one there. Once we were solidly inside the front room of the house, the door slammed shut behind me. Only then did the pressure disappear. My eyes darted around the small room. Now not only did I smell the pie, which sat on the small dining table, but a strange mixture of herbs hanging from the ceiling spices, and other things I couldn't identify, even with my sensitive fey nose. Animal bones sat on shelves among books and potion bottles. A beaded curtain hung across the room on the far side of an old green armchair and a small side table. Only the beads didn't look quite like beads. They were small bones, boiled dry and blanched. I gaped at her, my pulse racing like a galloping horse. You're a witch! The woman set the knife down on a small butcher block counter by the wall. My name is Rhea Thru. Thank you very much. You may call me Madame Rhea. The world spun. I backed to the wall and slid to the floor as the air in the room grew thin. What have I done? I was a fool. A damned fool. I had just as good as sold my life away to a witch, but not just any witch, Reathru, the witch of the Bloodwood.